industrial and social life of Canada is unquestionably affected by the advance of the motor car industry. And yet, few people are conscious of the influence it exerts towards the well-being of this country. For example, there are over 13,000 employees in the automobile factories and over 14,000 employees in contributing industries with an annual wage bill of around $35 million. And when you add all the dealers, retail salesmen, servicemen and others right across Canada, there are 70,000 persons who look to the automotive industry for a livelihood. To every Canadian, those figures must be impressive. Not only that, there is a huge sum spent for the purchase of raw materials and finished parts. General Motors alone buys from 380 Canadian companies. Then again, enormous amounts are spent for power and for transportation of raw materials and finished cars by railroad and truck, not forgetting a very substantial sum in government taxes. Well, I must admit, I always had the idea that the motor car industry was confined to a very small area. Far from it. As a matter of fact, there isn't any part of Canada that does not benefit in some manner. And I know that, particularly as far as General Motors is concerned. Let me see, it's about uh, 2.30. What do you say we take a trip through the factory? Sure, I'd like to very much. All right then, let's go. We can only touch the major operations, Jack, because it would take a long time to thoroughly cover each of our 64 departments. This is where the building of a fissure body begins, insulating the turret top. What is that black paste for? It binds the insulating material to the metal and has insulating properties in itself. Here's a piece of the material. The recesses form air pockets against the steel top. That's why the turret top protects the passenger so well against heat and cold, in addition to being absolutely quiet. This is the floor assembly. It is built up from quite a variety of stampings. And here are just a few of the many welding operations required to complete the floor. structure being finished after welding. There's great strength there because it is constructed on the principle of a bridge. These are body welding jigs. The body takes its final shape just as soon as all the panels are clamped into position. And there goes a steel floor and cowl into one of the jigs. All the panels are set in place and then the one piece steel turret top. Now the welding begins. That automatic machine controls every weld so that no mistake can be made. Do I understand correctly that when the body comes out, it is in one piece, just as if it were possible to stamp it out? Quite correct. And here comes a completed body now. Let's take a close look at it. The side panels are welded to the floor, top, and rear panels. The cowl is welded to the floor and top, and look how completely it is braced. Although the turret top is tremendously strong in itself, you see how it is further braced with steel U-channels. The ribs in the steel floor are made to give it additional strength and prevent the slightest possibility of rumble, and the steel rocker panels or body sills are in one piece with the floor. There isn't a single bolt or square inch of wood used in the body construction. The door is girder-type steel construction, liberally insulated, so that when you close it, there's no metallic or tinny sound. This is interesting. The welded joint is watertight, of course, but welding leaves a rough surface, and so joints are filled over with molten metal to provide a smooth surface.
You'll notice as we go down the line how the joints become gradually smoother with each operation. There isn't any trace of a joint there now. No, it's perfectly smooth curved and ready for the paint shop. Hello, Sandy. Hello, Bob. Mr. Brown, I'd like you to meet an old Oxford boy, Jack Brass. Glad to know you, Mr. Brown. Well, I'll be glad to know you, Mr. Brown. Yeah, uh, you know, Jack, uh, Mr. Brown started with the McLaughlin Carriage Company 36 years ago, and he's uh, still going strong. I certainly am, but I've seen a good many changes in those times here. I'll bet you have. It's quite a difference between making buggies and bodies, isn't there, Mr. Brown? Yes, there certainly is. We still maintain that old McLaughlin quality, one grade only, and that's the best. Well, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. Yeah. After the body receives its ground coat, every inch is rubbed down with fine sandpaper. I would have thought that the steel was smooth enough. No. It's comparatively rough, and so we spray on a ground coat and then rub it down to a surface as smooth as glass. These fellows certainly work fast putting on this color. Yes, that's because they're experts. Notice how they work in unison? There's a lot of skill required for that job. When the body leaves the spray booth, it passes through this long electric oven very slowly. And here's the body coming out now, completely dried and ready to go through the cooling tunnel before the first inspection is made. This is the first finish inspection. And those chalk marks indicate that the particular part does not come up to our standard of quality, so it has to be done again. Well, Walter, how's everything going in your department? Very fine, Bob, thank you. It certainly looks busy around here. Yes, it is. Oh, Jack. Yes, Bob. I'd like you to meet Walter Daniels. Jack Brandt, a friend of mine. Hey, Bob, I know you. you. Mr. Daniels is uh, superintendent of our paint department. You know, Jack and I have been through most of the paint shop, and he's been curious to know just uh, how long it takes to finish a body, and you're the man that can give us the first-hand information. Well, 26 years ago, when I first came to the block, in the paint and varnish days, it just took 21 days. Today, it's only a matter of hours. And that's what you get that's with good. modern production methods. <laughs> How's that for upholstery material cutting? Say, how many layers in that file? Oh, between 35 and 40. But to the electric knife, there might just as well be one layer. I don't suppose many people would think that a sewing machine plays a part in the building of an automobile. But there are a great many sewing operations in connection with the cushions, seat backs, and upholstery trim. Getting a sewing lesson, Bob? Oh, hello, Ed. Uh, just taking a friend of mine around the plant. Meet uh, Jack Brandt, Mr. Thompson. Pleased to meet you. Glad to know you, Mr. Thompson. Ed could tell you many a story about the old carriage days. Oh, bet he could. Yes. Take this department, for instance. I was many employees working here now and was in the whole plant 33 years ago. Isn't that wonderful? Imagine that. Yeah. The yeah. size of this plant certainly has been a great What is that fellow doing? Grainy window moldings. All the moldings are made of metal, and with different roller dies, this machine will reproduce graining to represent any type of wood. This is part of the upholstery department where we build seats and cushions. That material looks good enough for an overcoat. Yes, it does, and it has the quality with the looks. Here's the full-width front seat we use extensively in our coach models. The back is split, and each half tilts forward, making it very convenient, as well as exceedingly comfortable. What's this? A machine for making upholstery buttons. You see, they are made with the same material as the seat backs and cushions.
When the bodies reach here, they are completely upholstered and fitted with safety glass in every window. And now for the rain test. If there's any possibility of a leak, it will certainly show up with that driving spray. The bodies are next transported to another part of the plant to have electrical wiring and instruments installed and made ready for the assembly line. The bodies are hauled up that ramp on the side of the building to the wiring department. Yes, this is one of Canada's finest stamping plants. Watch what happens to this flat sheet of steel. A fender from a single sheet of steel. That's almost unbelievable. This machine stamps out half of a gasoline tank. And these are just samples of the hundreds of stamping and finishing operations going on in this plant. There's a fine record for the stamping plant. A thousand and twenty-five days since last lost time accident. That's almost three years. Yes, safety and everything is uppermost in the mind of General Motors employees. Now let's take a look at the radiator plant. These are called crimping machines for shaping flat brass and copper for the air cells and water passages. gathered in sets and placed in these frames for the solder bath. And there's the completed core ready for the shell. These are the chromium plating tanks for radiator shells, grills, and lots of other small parts. Chromium plate is the best finish, so we use nothing else. From here, the plated parts move along these conveyors to polishing machines, where they are quickly brought to a brilliant finish. starting point of the Chevrolet and Pontiac assembly line. The rear axle is placed in position on the completed frame. The axles, of course, are made in our own plant at St. Catharines, Ontario. And amongst many interesting operations are the machining of gears and cutting of teeth in the spiral bevel ring gears. We make a number of other units at St. Catharines. For example, the transmission. The original General Motors Synchro Mesh transmission, which completely ended trouble in gear changing. The men who test the transmissions have hearing very sensitive to gear noise, acquired through years of training.
steering gears are manufactured and assembled ready for the chassis. Electric starting motors and generators are produced. Also, the widely used AC spark plug. Next, the knee action units are installed with the front brakes and drums. With everything moving on continuously on those chains, it's amazing to me that the right part arrives when it is required. Well, everyone comments on that point. And it does take a tremendous amount of organization to keep everything running smoothly. Here is the engine sub-assembly line. The engines are built in our Walkerville plant in Ontario. Great foundries turn out cylinder blocks and a large variety of castings. You know, a trip through our engine plant is really an education. You would see big machines for leveling the face of cylinder blocks and paring off the metal as if it were soft wood. Honing machines for producing the mirror-like cylinder finish we must have grinding crankshaft bearings, and so on. Every part machined to the very finest limits. Then, assembly lines where you can watch each engine being built up part by part. And finally, hundreds of engines running under their own power to make sure they are built right and to test their individual performance and economy. At this point, the transmission, generator, and several other parts are added, and soon the engine is ready to be swung over to take its place in the chassis. What make of battery is that? Oh, that's a General Motors battery, with lots of capacity to handle our own radios, heaters, and other accessories. Over there you see the assembly of radiator and fenders on one bracket, which is mounted on the center front cross member in rubber. That's why you never get any rattle between the fenders and radiator of a General Motors car. Look at that wheel chute. There are dozens of wheels in there, yet the correctly colored set arrives at the end for the chassis which is about to move past it. And here's another example of organization. The body reaches the end of the line on the floor above, just in time to be lowered on the chassis for which it was built. Now that's a Pontiac body, but the next one will be a Chevrolet. You know, that's remarkable. It really is. Now we're coming towards the end of the line. The headlamps, bumpers, and hoods are installed. Then hot water is poured into the radiator to warm up the engine for its first run. And of course, we must have a few gallons of gasoline. The serial number plate is made on this machine and placed on the body under the hood. Inspectors make another check, and there goes another new General Motors car off to the plant test track to be checked and adjusted. he had something to do with the building of the first McLaughlin Buick. How long ago was that, Mr. 28 years. 
28 years. I'm sure you had some interesting experience yes. that time, Mr. Moore. The, the uh, thought of building that car stirs up some very fond memories. Today. I'm sure it does. Well, we're on our way down to the final inspection to see how you do turn them out now. <laughs> In this final inspection department, after the car has been thoroughly washed, every inch of the body inside and out is again inspected. And when the okay is given, the car goes to the loading dock for shipping to distant points by rail, or to the export department, where we ship to some 20 countries all over the world, or by road, but not under its own power. And so, the marvel of the motion picture has brought to you brief glimpses of manufacturing and building operations in the modern plants of General Motors, the leader in one of Canada's greatest industries. General Motors produces for better transportation two leading lines of commercial cars and trucks, Chevrolet and GMC with a model to suit every possible requirement in the field of transport. And six outstanding makes of passenger cars. Cadillac, the automobile supreme, without an equal anywhere in the world. Spirited as the thoroughbred and radiating an air of refinement even to the smallest detail. The LaSalle V8, swift, silent, and so easy to handle. A luxurious car offering many thrilling surprises, not the least of which is its remarkably low cost. And again, it's McLaughlin Buick for 1937, the car that still enjoys an owner loyalty not even approached by any other make in its price class. Built in four series from the nimble Special 44 to the Majestic Limited 49. The Pontiac 6, Canada's finest low-priced car. A brand new Canadian automobile, proved through every conceivable method of testing over a long period. A big, roomy car, making new economy records every day. Oldsmobile, the car that has everything for 1937. Oldsmobile once again sets a new styling acknowledged everywhere as the leader. A typical example of General Motors' balanced design, with not one curve exaggerated to create the impression of a big car. And Chevrolet, the complete car, completely new. Master and Master Deluxe, both on a wheelbase of 112 and a half inches. Unchallenged for dollar value in the low price field. All of these fine cars in their various price ranges excel in every detail, including that feature which is so important today, safety. With perfected hydraulic brakes, safety glass in every window, a rugged frame foundation, and the first all silent, all steel body with the famous Fisher solid steel turret top. Because the automobile industry is so deeply interwoven with our national daily life and in the forefront of Canadian progress, the many thousands of men and women across Canada engaged in this industry can truly be called nation builders.